This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to show a movie about how people's minds have deteriorated along with the environment. It is an adventure, comedy, science fiction, and thriller film called Idiocracy. Spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. At the beginning of the film, the narrator suggests that natural selection is indifferent to intellect. It means that in a society where knowledge is consistently debased, less intellectual people outbreed the more intelligent ones. With this, demographic superiority favors the ones that are least likely to drive society to advancement. The director claims that the film shows the dangers of collective incompetence instead of the state's oppressiveness. It centers around an army librarian who is not qualified for his job and realizes how humanity could crumble because of mediocrity, or the lack thereof. In 2005, army librarian Joe Bowers is selected to join a new mission. Sergeant Keller selects him because he is the most average man in the armed forces. Joe becomes the first subject for their human hibernation experiment, as discussed by the military officials. Officer Collins discusses the nature of the experiment, which freezes humans indefinitely for the long-term benefits of the army. With the lack of a suitable female candidate, they hire a girl named Rita. The military bribed her pimp, Upgrade, for Rita to fully participate in the experiment. On the day of the experiment, Joe and Rita lie on separate beds with tubes connected to their body. According to Officer Collins, both of them will be asleep for a year, which scares Rita. Joe assures her that everything is fine, and the mission resumes. After the beds are covered, Officer Collins locks them in a top secret facility. After some time, Officer Collins appears in the headlines because of his involvement in Upgrade's illegal activities. He gets arrested, and as the head of the experiment, the mission becomes forgotten. The secret facility has been torn down, leaving Rita and Joe in landfills unconscious. Over the following centuries, society leads the most brilliant humans to refrain from having children, while the least intelligent citizens reproduce indiscriminately. It results in having increasingly dumber generations. In a garbage avalanche, Joe's bed slides down to the city, and he awakens. Joe ends up in Frito's apartment, but his questions annoy him, so he gets kicked out. He's confused to find himself in a vastly unfamiliar place with drastically changed humans. Then former Washington, D.C. has turned into a capitalistic hellhole. Even their fashion and way of presenting themselves are highly impacted by society's ingrained capitalism. Moreover, Joe is made fun of because of the way he speaks. Language is merely used as an advertising function rather than communication. It is somehow similar to our society today wherein social media's purpose is merely for advertisement rather than connecting with people. In retrospect, we are vessels for company advertisements. The visual and verbal highlights of the scenes expose the decline in progress in that time. Unaware of the year, Joe wanders the streets for help, but the communication barrier is present. Even the English language deteriorated, and citizens talk in registers of the language. Desperate for help, Joe goes to a hospital to seek treatment, but to no avail. Although technology is still advanced, it is often malfunctioning and driven by commercialism. The healthcare workers are also seemingly anti-intellectual with handling patients akin to low software education. While waiting to consult a doctor, Joe finds a magazine copy that indicates the year 2505. Shortly after, Dr. Lexus arrives as he smokes in the office. Without being of help, the doctor charges Joe money, but he does not have a barcode tattoo to pay for it. Joe looks out the window and realizes that he has been asleep for more than 500 years while the earth has deteriorated. Unable to pay his hospital bill, Dr. Lexus reports Joe to the police. The police officers arrive and arrest Joe without allowing him to explain what happened. The following day, Joe is at court to plead for his case while being assigned Frito as his lawyer. To his confusion, there is no sense of formality even in the courtroom. Instead of defending him, Frito tells the judge that Joe has to be in prison, and his fate is decided. Meanwhile, Rita has also escaped her chamber. She tries to contact Upgrade, but to no avail. Unlike Joe, she has no idea what year it is, and resumes her work as a call girl. She also realizes that people have become so unintellectual that she can earn money without essential services. Throughout the film, Rita is constantly worried about her financial situation. She brings up Upgrade's name several times out of fear that he will charge her for the money that she owes. However, she is puzzled but happy about the ease of access to money in the future. Back in 2005, Joe and Rita are opposites. However, the latter is notably thriving in new society despite being part of a lower income group. The concept of labor is no longer relevant to the world she is living in. Although professions are still present, their practices are below average, and workers are unfit for almost anything. It is seen in several sectors like business, justice, healthcare systems. Another notable scene is Joe's imprisonment without justice. People have become too incapacitated to give righteous judgment, exposing how capitalism has brainwashed society. En route to prison, Joe's name is changed to Not Sure by a broken speech recognition machine for his barcode tattoo. 
Afterward, he takes a rudimentary IQ test along with the other inmates before they are admitted, realizing that he is the smartest among them. On the way to prison, Joe tricks one of the guards by saying he is meant to be released. Without further reasoning, the guards let him free. Without anywhere to go, Joe returns to Frito's apartment to ask him for help. According to Frito, a time machine could help Joe return to the year 2005, but it costs a lot of money. Joe easily bribes him with promises of wealth from compound interest on a bank account in the 21st century that he will open for Frito. The lawyer eventually agrees to his plan, so they leave the apartment while police officers are chasing them. Along the way, Joe picks Frida up, who is surprised to see him after their departure. There, Joe reveals that the year is 2505, and they have hibernated for 500 years. Rita is in disbelief, and her concerns grow as police officers get near. Everything finally makes sense to Rita upon hearing Joe's revelation. Back then, it would be impossible for Rita to earn quickly. She gradually grasps the concept along the way, and sees it as an opportunity. To think that the most average man could be the smartest one in the future poses so much irony. The scene shows how Joe has humility and self-awareness. Although he is publicized as the most intelligent one, he refuses to claim recognition. Joe is eager to travel back in time, but trusting Frito is a considerable risk. Without a choice, they settle. Unfortunately, Frito's car breaks down, so they are forced to run. Frito leads them to a gigantic Costco establishment which is a part of their destination to the time machine. While waiting for the train, Rita uses the comfort room, which separates her from the two. Joe is accidentally identified by one of the tattoo scanners and is apprehended for breaking the law. A swarm of officers arrests him after he decides to stay and wait for Rita. As Joe is being escorted out, Rita hides in the store, unsure of what may happen. To Joe's surprise, the police officers bring him to the White House after garnering the cabinet's attention for having the highest IQ. There, he meets several sectorial secretaries and President Camacho. They immediately appoint Joe as Secretary of Interior because he is coined as the most intelligent man on earth. The President promises the people that Joe will solve the impossible problems, such as food shortages and the crippled economy within a week. During his first meeting with the cabinet members, they discuss the problem of their shortage of crops. Before offering a solution, Joe demands to talk with Frito and Rita, which the cabinet members immediately do. On site, Joe discovers that the citizens have no idea of what water is. All they drink is a thirst simulator called Brondo, whose contents are like an energy drink. As a newly elected secretary, Joe orders all crops to be switched to water and promises that plants will grow. Some claim that the film is a critique of America's prevalent corporatization. Some parts of the film show how big corporations have taken over the entire world. With this, lack of access to water and natural resources become an issue. The company mentioned in the film has gained ownership of humanity's basic needs. As a result, the citizens are exposed to products that do not promote a healthy lifestyle. It is also evident today how privatization of natural resources fuels capitalistic practices. Now reunited, Joe and Rita become closer, and they share how weird it is to be smarter than everyone else. With his plan in process, Joe is hopeful that crops will be revived. However, the stock of the Brondo Corporation vanishes overnight, resulting in widespread unemployment and no discernible improvement in the crop situation. The enraged public riots, and Joe is made the scapegoat, receiving a day of rehabilitation in the form of a public demolition derby dubbed Monday Night Rehabilitation. On the day of his sentence, Joe is given a broken vehicle to fight off a much bigger one, giving him a slim chance of surviving. While watching live from the television, Rita notices that plants sprouted in the fields, so she and Frito rush to the event place. Rita tries to talk to President Camacho, but he is too entertained by the event at the moment. Meanwhile, Joe manages to drive with the torn down car and make the two bigger trucks collide. Another prisoner that Joe has to defeat is Beef Supreme, a notorious criminal. To save Joe, Rita bribes a cameraman to broadcast the blossoming crops to the city with Frito in tow. As the camera pans to the newly sprouted crops, Rita projects it to the screen. The citizens are in awe to see crops after decades and finally believe Joe. As Joe is about to be burnt with a flamethrower, President Camacho notices the flourishing new plants on the stadium's large screens and grants him a pardon. In a country where the highest levels of power are questionable, there is no sense of a sound government. Leaders decide on things that they merely find beneficial to them. Their ideals are focused on self-sufficiency and solely on monetary gains. Other than that, popularity is the basis for their title. What our society today somehow reflects that of the film. Officials have different priorities that are far from what people need and would only benefit their self-interests. Like Joe, people suffer from biased views of its citizens because of their follow-the-leader mentality. At the after-party, Rita and Joe decide to stay in the future after finding themselves fitting in. Not long after, he follows Camacho's term and becomes president. He marries Rita, and she becomes the nation's first lady. Both of them lead the nation and have a family as Joe attempts to express his hope for society to become great again. 
The film was initially released in just a few cinemas without theatrical promotions. However, it gradually became a cult hit. Its comedic scenes are constant throughout the film, but its core theme revolves around how society could change for the worse when greed and close-mindedness come hand in hand. In the age of lazy laughs, the film could also be considered rare. How can a comedy film hold so many lessons beneath its hilarious facade? Although the concept is holistically comedic, the film still has something to say. Of course, the underlying message is that humans should take science, knowledge, and research seriously before we develop our own idiocracy. Joe did not only expose the faulty system in the new government, but he also aimed to reshape it. As average individuals, the message of the film could also be interpreted in a way that we, regular people, have choices and voices. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.